So um, emotions are important, and that's the first thing. So we, sh we shouldn't think as emotion as something that gets in that get in the way that impede us to do stuff, especially professionally talking. Emotions are something that we use every day, and they help us cope with the environment. If we wouldn't have had emotions, probably we would have much more problems in uh, coping with the society we live in. Second. Emotional intelligence matters. That's also the title of my talk. And in this way, I want to convince you that the idea that these are, there are skills that you basically do not learn at school, you do not learn explicitly, but they make up most of your life. I mean, we spend the whole days talking to people, interacting with people, but nobody, I think, ever told you, besides your parents maybe, a little bit, how you should do that, how you should behave with others, how you can understand how the others are feeling. All this is something that we learn by doing. But actually, I am not the only one now who is saying that it's very important to train these abilities. In the US, there is a program, it's called a Ruler, which is uh, supported by the Obama um, administration. And it's delivered by the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, so University of Yale, in which they train students and adolescents in uh, developing their emotional intelligence abilities. And that's something, something that is spreading out. It's many thousands of, several thousands of schools across the US that have used this program now. And this is something extremely new, because so far when we went to school, or what we want to do with this learning stuff, but we learn hard skills, let's say. So we learn how to count, count. we learn how to uh, write, we learn how to build stuff, but and learning is not, doesn't teach you understanding. And one of the key points of our lives is understanding others and being understood by others. And that's really important. It's really something that is relevant for a personal life, but also professionally, because we have colleagues, we have supervisors, we have subordinates. And in all these cases, there are emotions that inevitably happen. And we shouldn't think that these are elements that give us issues, but actually they should be used in a way that make working together better and more effective. I hope the presentation will come, because now I would have shown you that if you want to become James Bond now, what you need to do is develop your emotional intelligence. Indeed, there is a new movie of James Bond which is out these days, I think, or it's going to come out in the next weeks. And this is about um, an announcement, a job posting that the MI6, so the secret services in the UK, posted online. And what they look for is not something which is a night, who is an IT expert or somebody who is an expert in, um, I don't know, army or whatever, or engineering. They look for people who can, I would really like to show it to you, but trust me, it is like this. Um, people who understand beliefs, thoughts, and others, basically. What they want is basically is emotional, intelligent people. They don't write it this way, but that's all that is about. And um, I think that this kind of already starts to clarify why these sort of abilities can matter. But if we want to turn to scientific evidence, to some of the studies that have been conducted, um, I can mention to you one very interesting, actually two very interesting correlational studies that they found that stock market returns, so talking about stock exchange, drop after a national team of football is eliminated from an important tournament like the World Cup or the European Cup. So what happens? Last uh, two years ago, Italy, last year Italy was kicked out at the first round, unfortunately for me, and the day after you would see that there was a drop in the stock market. But why is that? I mean, it has nothing to do, right? I mean, the football team with stock market, I mean, there's really no reason why this should happen. Well, the reason is that people were a bit more sad or unhappy because of what happened the day before, and they brought it to work the day after. And when they were seeing how things were going for companies, they would use their emotional state to make judgments about what they should do. And that's the problem, because they were using emotional information that was not related to the actual and the current situation, but something that happened the day before. And that's the first thing. Emotional intelligence helps you. It's the idea that you can, if you are emotionally intelligent, understand why you're feeling a certain way in this specific moment, and being able to identify the causes for your state. 
A second group of studies, researchers called people and home and ask them, okay, uh, just please uh, tell us how, you, how satisfied are you with your life? How healthy are you? How is your financial situation? And then when they started looking at the data, they realized that there was something funny, because people who were interviewed, on average, of course, people who were interviewed in the days, in sunny days, they would be more satisfied with their life, better health, and better financial situation. Well, if that's true, why are we here? Should we go to Africa, all of us, or south of Europe, and just be happier, healthier, and richer? <laughs> Truth is, of course, what happened is that people were in slightly better mood because of the sun outside. And while they will ask about something else, they would use this information to answer that question. Indeed, it was enough that when they did a rerun of the study, pointing out right before these questions, about the weather, so how is the weather today? That people would somehow become aware of the fact that it's sunny outside, and I like when it's sunny, so I'm in a slightly better mood than average. And this would be enough to take away the effect of the weather on their responses about life satisfaction, health, and financial status. So these are important evidence, because it really tells you that there's a lot of information that we gather from our emotions and we use, the, importance, the important thing is to use it in the right way. Um, another example, there is a, a paradigm, a protocol, a task that is used in psychology and economics, which is called the ultimatum game. The ultimatum game is you basically ask two people to come to the lab or to the room where you want to do, do the experiment, and you give uh, an amount of money to the first person, let's say 15 francs, something like this, and you say, okay, this money is yours, now you, have, you can, you have to split between you and the other person. You can decide to keep as much money as you want of this pot and give some, of to, give some to the other person. The second person, though, will have the chance to accept your offer, and in that case, everybody goes home with the money that has been uh, split, or we'll have the possibility to reject your offer. And this means that you both go home with no money. <laughs> what do you think it happens if you give somebody, if the first one splits between 14 and 1 only to the second person? Do you think that the second person would still accept it? No, actually. I can tell you that most cases people will not. But why is that? I mean, in the end, you would still go home with 1 instead of 0. So from an economics perspective, if you just follow the basic of economics, or if you are a perfect rational person, you would always have to accept, as long as you get at least one franc out of those 15, because one franc is way better than zero francs. But people know, people don't accept it. They prefer to punish a little bit themselves in order to punish more somebody else, who they think has been unfair. And so they feel angry somehow against this person. They feel morally disgusted, this is a term we use in psychology, against these people. So these emotions basically motivate their decision and they decide not to let him go, get away with it. So now we both go home empty-handed because you were greedy. Um, these are clear examples of how which we are, because if we even reach the point that we want to punish, our, we decide to punish ourselves in order to punish somebody else more. Wow, I mean, and if the other person goes home with 14 and you go home with one, I mean, you both go home in principle with something more. So what's the point of that? The point is that emotions are really part of our daily interaction, our daily lives. And one of the most important things to understand is that emotions and cognition do not work separately, they work together. You cannot separate emotions and cognition because every emotion includes cognitive elements, as we just saw. And cognition is part of our emotional experience. So it depends a lot on how we appraise the world that we have certain emotions. For example, I always make the same example about a snake. If most of us would see a snake, would be extremely afraid, scared, would try to run away, on a hike. Let's, let's imagine that we are, uh, walking, we are hiking on the mountains and we see a snake. Most of us will freeze or we start to step back. But if you really are into snakes, you really like them, you will probably approach at a certain distance in order to be able to admire the snake that you like. 
in a complete free environment. And that's because the way we appraise the situation, if it's the same situation, is completely different. So these are some of the cognitive elements that make up the emotions that we experience. And that's also why emotional intelligence is part, it's something that can be trained and is actually a skill that merits as much attention as IQ or other sorts of intelligence that have been already studied. Uh, the most important thing about emotional intelligence is that it is something that matters personally and professionally. Indeed, if you would be able to read or listen to people who talk about uh, successful businessmen, for example, you would see that most of the reasons why they praise these people are emotion-related abilities. I would have read with you now a passage from the biography of Steve Jobs, in which I don't remember who talks about him, probably one of his, uh, uh, one of his um, colleagues, that would say that Steve Jobs was great because he could delight people, he could find interfaces that were pleasant, he could find messages that were enticing. And all the description that he provides of Steve Jobs goes around the idea of uh, him as being somebody emotionally intelligent, somebody who could use this information. But this is just anecdotal. What does science tell us? Well, I reviewed a bit of the literature on this theme, and what you see is that the people who have higher emotional intelligence they are better at managing stress at work. This is a huge thing. We all are bombarded by email messages. We all have demands, people to interact with, meetings all the time. And the number of tasks that we have to accomplish every day in our professional but also private life, it's terrible. So imagine how good is the ability to manage stress in those conditions. Second, um, People who are higher in emotional intelligence have also better relationships with their colleagues and supervisors and subordinates. We all go to workplaces, we all have colleagues, and we all know how bad it would be to go to work in a place where you have basically no relationships with others. I hope nobody of you experiences this, but just try to imagine, you would go to work to a place where there's nobody you can work with? That's terrible. And imagine that this can be solved, because sometimes it's an issue of being able to relate. And this is something that one can learn. Third, um, studies about sales force, people who go about sale say, selling stuff, they found out that if they get training in emotional intelligence, they can grow their sales up between 10 and 20%, which is huge. Of course, this depends on the job, this depends on the clients, but there are jobs in which there is a lot of um, emotions attached to the topics of discussion. Talk, think about insurances. When I mean, you're talking about health insurances, you're talking about that, insur life insurances, so you're talking about death or your death of on one of your relatives. What's going to happen to my sons after I'm gone? So in all these elements, there's a lot of uh, personal, uh, experience that is emotional, that needs to be accounted for. And this is something that if you're better at relating, at managing other people's emotion, this can become good for your job. But all in all, the studies just point in one direction. If you are better, if you're higher in emotional intelligence, you simply are more productive. Because you basically are better at managing tasks. You know how to interact with people. So when somebody gets to you asking for something, you know how to basically, let's put it this way, um, accommodate his needs without letting him or she interrupt your flow of work. All these things put together identify one of the main applications, let's say, of the emotional intelligence, which is the work environment. Even more importantly, for, uh, there have been studies in which they showed that the uh, uh, success of executives comes, it can be predicted, sorry, by the combination of experience and um, emotional intelligence. 
It's not just experience, and it's not just emotional intelligence, of course. But if you have both, then you have the key for an executive to, to get probably a good executive. So if you want to hire somebody with a direct position, you should look at his, at his CV or her CV and see whether he has the good qualification and experience. But that may be not enough. Because what happens if Dan is not capable of managing his groups, is not capable of handling his clients? These are both competencies that are very important for success of executive leaders. Um, one of, so I hope that all these somehow convinced you of the fact that emotions are relevant and important on one side, and on the other side, that emotional intelligence matters for the workplace. But there is one thing that I haven't done so far, which is quite kind of, well, you spoke about emotional intelligence, but what is emotional intelligence? The definition of emotional intelligence is actually a complex one, in the sense that we used to define emotional intelligence, or we define emotional intelligence, as the combination of different abilities. And in the rest of my talk, I will try to guide you through each of these abilities and give you some ideas of how they apply. And I will try to give you some little tips for each of them that you can take with yourself. And if you want, you can try to see whether they apply to your personal or professional life, because both are relevant and important for well-being. So emotional intelligence is made of four abilities. First one is emotion, what we call emotion understanding. And emotion understanding means uh, being able to understand others in terms of, based on the context. I will say more about this later. Not, oh, sorry, I said others, but others and oneself. So it's actually split in two in the idea of emotional intelligence. Then we have emotion recognition which is the ability to recognize the emotion of somebody else from his behavior, from his facial expression, from his gestures, from his voice. Third, extremely important, emotion regulation. So the capacity that I have to regulate my own emotion. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, but the talk that will follow mine will be much more, will dig much more deep into this domain. Finally, which is basically the sum of, the all, of, the, of the, all the other competencies, is emotion management. Emotion management is basically the ability to manage other people's emotion. You shouldn't think it as an, in a bad way because it's what we do all the time. It's just we need to, we need to find the term and we use management. Uh, the idea is that people come to you with their own emotion experience and you have to cope with that help them go through or just account for the fact that they have an emotion and recognize it and do something about it, because that's the point. If they have any emotions, it means that something important happened to them. This is some of the things I really find <coughs> important. For competencies, the, for, uh, the results of different studies, and these are the four competencies that I was talking about. The last one being emotion management. And uh, I was saying that there is something that I didn't say before, but I really want to point out. So if somebody is having an emotion, it probably means that the thing about which he or she is emoting, is having the emotion, is relevant for him. That's one of the ways to see emotions. Emotions are relevance detectors. So if we have an emotion, it's only because the thing that caused it, it's important for us. So never disregard the emotion of somebody. Let's start with emotion understanding. So emotion understanding, as I briefly introduced before, is the ability to understand the emotion huh, of oneself or somebody else from contextual information. So something happens and we are capable of understanding that, of guessing basically what's the emotion that this person might ex um, experience. Um, Let's do this together, so just try to see how good we are in understanding ourselves. The emotional space, as we call it, is made of two dimensions. On the horizontal axis, you have the pleasantness, so pleasant and unpleasant. On the vertical axis, you have the level of energy, so high or low. This is basically one of the instruments that is used in psychology to ask people how they feel. 
So one, so the quadrant up on the right, would be positive high energy, like joy, happiness. Two would be positive low in energy, and this would be something like being calm, serene. Three is uh, um, negative and low energy, something like a bit like sadness, something that's a mood a bit like gloomy sadness. And four is uh, negative, so very unpleasant. I feel very unpleasant now, and, but I'm very energetic. So something like anger or very strong disgust. So let's do it together. So if I would ask you, who of you is in quadrant number one? Raise your hands. Okay, so how many of you are in quadrant number two? Good. And uh, number three? Oh, one, good. And the number four? Good, very happy about that. Actually, if it happens that somebody would have raised their hands, I would have been quite worried about what I was going to say. Uh, just by information, just a little information, actually two and three, especially three, is considered one of the best states to learn the new things, to study. So being mildly negative, but not really sad, like depressed, but a little bit, uh, and not too much energetic is considered one of the best states to learn new abilities and new concepts. I think it was sort of easy to answer this question, but if I would have asked you, how do you feel now, without giving you a map, and just asking you to choose a word to describe, it would have been much more, we don't have the time to do it, but it would have been much more difficult. Think about when people ask you how do you feel, or when you ask people how are you today. Think about the answers that you get. I am pretty sure that 80% of the times the answers are good, bad, so and so, okay. That's it. That's all the emotional literacy that we use in most of our daily interactions. I mean, it's very different if you are proud of something that just happened, if you're happy, if you're calm. So these are all positive. You can all say that they're good, but they are very different. They imply very different behaviors. They imply very different appraisals about something that happened. And the thing is that nobody teaches us this. We don't know these words. We just learned it by interacting with other people. There's no literacy about this. You can learn about how to um, scientifically defined plants or animals, the filum and the species, but we don't know how to define emotions, or which words to use when it's appropriate. And actually, this is one of the directions of the Ruler project I mentioned before is going, teaching people the emotional words that they can use to describe their own experience. The thing is that if you are able to understand <laughs> your emotion, to label them, to understand what, why they are, the causes of your emotion, you can basically identify the correct source of the emotion and then know when this is irrelevant or relevant for the decision you have to make. That's exactly the cases I mentioned at the beginning. So if you knew that the, 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 nice, the better mood you are is actually due to the weather, you won't use this information to say that you're happier with your life, or that you're richer, or that you're healthier, because this is not exactly how you would evaluate it in, this, in a rainy day. And you're using the information in the wrong way. That's very important. And uh, this, this we don't have time to go through. This was um, another study showing exactly the same principle I just explained. So if you have the correct information, you have a different behavior. So you, don't take, you take less risky choices if you're afraid about something. That's in general. So if you're afraid of something that is not even related to the task, you may have a different behavior. While if you are made aware of this, you would probably take the risky choice more. I don't know if it's good or, good or bad. The thing is that the behavior changes based on the emotion that you have that has nothing to do with the task you're doing. As I promised, uh, I wanted to give you little, very simple tips that one can see whether they apply to their own life and whether they can, you, one can use them. So if you want to better understand your emotions, and remember, this is the first step to manage them and to regulate them. You need to identify the right causes. 
So probably it's not that the person who just didn't let you in while you're driving that is so terrible and you really need to shout at him and look after him in order to beat him up, but probably you had something better that uh, worse than happened at work before and now you're just basically using the anger that you have for something else against this event. Pay attention to your behaviors. That's a bit related to what I said before. Emotions tell us that the thing about which we emote is important. So if you behave in a certain way, it probably means something. Pay attention to this. Sometimes suddenly we start speaking with a different voice, we start gazing away. Why is that? Am I uncomfortable in the situation? Why is that? Try to do this. Label your emotions. That links to what we said before. If you can label your emotions, you can communicate them and people actually are, can do something with you. If they don't know if you're just sad or angry or generally unhappy about something, they cannot really help you concretely unless they know exactly why this is about. Last but not least at all, get feedback. People can give you very nice insights about yourself. You cannot even realize how something pisses you off until somebody else is telling you. And I have a colleague, and uh, we used to work together quite a lot, and uh, while uh, we were having meetings, she would, sometimes when other people were talking, she would make a, a disgusted face, the most disgusted face I've ever seen in my life. And I remember I was talking and she was doing that, I said, oh my, what am I saying? And actually, and I saw that she was doing also to others. And I was asking myself, oh wow, that's really bad. I mean, that's your boss, you shouldn't do this, right? Um, and then I confronted her, I spoke to her and asked, so what, what was that? And basically she didn't realize at all that she was having this behavior. And she didn't mean it to be so negative about the thing. Of course she didn't like it and she wanted to say something, but there was nothing that she wanted to communicate. And this feedback that I gave her helped her to change this behavior because she didn't realize about it and people were making inferences about how bad she thought of them. So feedback can be very important. But emotion understanding is not just about one's own emotion, it's also about others' emotion. And when we talk about understanding emotion of others, we talk about the ability to understand emotion from the context in which uh, these things happen. And it is very different if you have to interact with somebody who has just been through a very tender experience, like holding his son or her daughter in their arms, or somebody who just had a loss or visited a graveyard. You know this intuitively, that you have to behave differently. But sometimes we basically ignore these elements. And this is very important because then leads to problems in the communication, in the interaction. Try to understand the emotions in which others are. Because maybe it's not the same one you think they should be. And this is more important for leaders. If you need to guide a team, you need to be empathic with your team. You need to lead them, understand them, and respond to their needs. Because what you want is that they perform well. And if they are having a reaction, on emotional reaction on something, first of all, it means, if it's, if it's work-related, it means that that thing matters to them. So if they're even getting into uh, an emotional reaction into a mistake they made, it still means that they care about the stuff that they were doing. Otherwise, they wouldn't have cared, basically, of the criticism. These are two tips for emotional understanding in others that I would like to share with you. Uh, the first one, what we call empathic active listening. If you want to get a better understanding of others, maybe you say, oh, you are sad today, or oh, you are happy today. That's not the best way to get to know if the person is really happy or not. What we call is check in. Try to say you look like, you seem. This way you basically open up the possibility for a discussion about it and the other person can confirm or disconfirm what you say and accept to be wrong, there's no problem. The other thing which is very important, consider what the other, the person you're talking to, you're interacting to, finds important, not what you find important. 
If your husband wants to watch the TV game of football in the evening, don't be mad at him. It's not silly necessarily. Maybe for him it matters something. Maybe it's a way he uses this to connect with friends who are not there at the same time. So try to understand why the thing is important for him. And the reference to individuals here is absolutely random. <laughs> and, uh, and I think this makes it for emotional understanding in oneself and in others. Let me turn to emotional regulation, which is basically the same what comes next. Once you have an emotion, then you need to regulate your own emotion. So emotional regulation as a definition is the ability to regulate one's own emotions in critical circumstances. How do Sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. It smells really good. So it's up to you, you can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> okay, thank you. So you saw this where cognitive, non-cognitive emotional regulation strategies, the moving, the tapping, and this is actually what we all adults also do sometimes. We try to regulate our emotions with non-verbal behavior, but we also have cognitive emotional regulation strategies. And I will just give you a brief idea of what I'm talking about in terms of non-cognitive and cognitive, again, under the forms of tips. These are strategies that may seem very simple, very basic, but they actually work quite well. You'll see more about meditation and breathing when we will do the mindfulness, when we will hear the talk of my colleague who will talk right after me. 
But this is really powerful. It is known that it has effects on the body. It's not just something that psychological, it's physiological as well, just breathing. Uh, physical activity, you are in, the, in trouble, I mean, some, some of us do it or would like to do it, just stop for a minute, go for a walk, five minutes, ten minutes, it doesn't need to be very intense, it's enough to do something, you just regulate your emotion because you make a space, a moment between what's happening now and your reaction. You basically try to make a little bubble of empty space that doesn't that goes beyond, be between the, the causes of your emotion and your behavior. Talk to someone, same principle as before, talking to somebody is very important. You get a lot of, I mean, we all do that, right? We all have our best friends, spouses, partners, friends, and we go to them and we ask them emotional support, basically, even if not explicitly, that's what we do all the time. And the simple thing that parents told to kids since uh, decades, Count to ten. It's the same principle. Put a space between the event and your reaction. Of course, we are cognitive people as well. So we can use cognitive strategies, especially in the context of work. We maybe do not have the time to go and run five minutes. So we have to face the situation and try to elaborate a way to cope with what's happening. It may, this, uh, these things they may seem more, they all are about the same principle. Think about the positive side. This may sound easy, but actually it's something that we do sometimes. It's just a matter of learning how to do it more often. Lower the importance. Sometimes what happens is not that it's as important as you think. It doesn't really deserve your emotional reaction. Try to see it in a different perspective. Think about something else. Take a break. Go, do another task, leave that task for later. Or simply sometimes accept the reality. I mean, there's no point in keep thinking about event you can do nothing about. This is one of the most problematic issues in terms of health, rumination. So you keep thinking about the same event over and over again. It doesn't help you. My spouse left me, my spouse left me, my spouse left me, my spouse left me, my spouse left me. It doesn't get you any better. Actually, it reinforces every time the loss. It doesn't lead you anywhere. Uh, the only solution is to accept the reality. But all these things together, we normally label them under the terms reappraise, reevaluate what happens to you. You have this power. It's very simple somehow. You can reevaluate what happens. And this is proven by many scientific studies that this will make you healthier. Your well being will go up. The third competence I want to talk about, which is the element, one of the elements of emotional intelligence, it's emotional recognition. Emotional recognition in the way we define it is the ability to understand somebody else's emotion from his or her nonverbal behavior. And this is also a video. Can we try also? Good. Perfect. So please tell me which emotion. Can we replay it once, please? So, how many of you think is joy? Good. <laughs> how many of you think is fear? How many of you think is irritation? Wow. How many of you think is anger? Okay, very nice. Of course, this is a very simple example, and I'm happy because if somebody would have told me this looks like joy, I don't know how we could have handled that, but in any case, I'm very happy you all recognize this as an expression of anger. Of course, this is staged. Of course, this is all the elements of the prototypical anger expression. Because it moves the face in a certain way, the movement, the gestures, the voice. But actually, <coughs> it's not so easy all the time. So what do we look at? What shall we look at? This is part of the idea of sharing with you some of the uh, scientific knowledge about emotion expression. Well, we all look at the face first. And just to make it clear, we infer a lot of stuff from nonverbal behavior, even if we are not aware of this. Because we learned through many exchanges to read a little bit how people express their emotional state by the face. And this sometimes goes against their words. I, sometimes it seems like it's in face, so they go well together. 
But still, these are two channels that we analyze somehow separately. And when we look at the face, of course, the key elements are the eyes, the gaze, the eyebrows. It's very different, a frown from a surprised face with the raised eyebrows, and the mouth. This is also very interesting because studies showed, for example, that Westerners, so people like most of us, we think, look more at certain facial features, while, like the mouth, while the Asians tend to look more at the eyes to read the emotions of others. And actually, a very anecdotal evidence about this is the emoji, you know, the emoticons, the little faces that we also put in messages. We change emotions by changing the shape of the mouth, a smile or a sad expression. In, uh, in Japan, most emojis change the shape of the eyes. That's uh, part of this. Um, but sometimes, we simply don't know why we make some judgments. So, if I show you these two faces, you know, it's the same person, of course, Julia Roberts. Which of these two pictures you consider more spontaneous? So, who think is the one on the left? Who think is the one on the right? Okay. Exactly. That's exactly my point. So we all, or most of us, perceive the one on the right as being more spontaneous, more authentic. But what is that? I mean, the mouth, okay, she smiles a bit more if you want. But it's not that. Actually, what makes the difference is this. These little wrinkles on the corner of the eyes, we use them to infer the spontaneity of the expression. And this is actually weird. I mean, it was actually weird to find out afterwards that this is a movement that most people, basically almost nobody, can do it voluntarily. It's very difficult to move this muscle on at will. With, I mean, the, you can train that, I can actually do it, like, but uh, that's my job. <laughs> That's my job. Um, but in general, it's something that even trained people have issues, have problems in doing that. And that's interesting to see how we, during the evolution, we picked up this little cue. And even though we didn't know about it, we used it as an element to infer the authenticity of somebody's reaction. And uh, that's really the, one of the key points to think about how we do get about the emotions of others. But sometimes the face does not tell the whole truth. So this is a study that were published in Science, and it's about the recognition of emotion from facial expressions. These are two real pictures of two tennis players. Maybe you recognize uh, one of the two, at least. And uh, they've been taken after a very important point. And one was a winning point, and the other one was a losing point. If I would ask you which of these two pictures was taken after a winning point, who among you would say number one? Who would say number two? It's basically split in half, more or less. And which is essentially the point? Because sometimes the face does not tell the whole story. If I show you the body, is it clearer now? It is. Indeed, we, I mean, not we, but we, it's like we showed that in this case, it's very easy to understand if it's a winning point or a losing point. But by, just by looking at the face, it's basically impossible. This is an extremely positive reaction. You see it from the body. And the other one is negative. But if you look at the face alone, you miss this information. So pay attention to the body. Sometimes it tells you something different or something else than the face. But the most important thing is that any behavior means something uh, in the context when it's done and by the person that, is, that performs it. I was talking about my colleague in the strange movement of the face. For her, it was something that she would do regularly. It wasn't really meaning something. But somebody like me would have interpreted as disgust, as anger. 
this gesture, like foot clapping, can be baseline. Somebody may do it all the time. Somebody can be a sign of impatience, which means that let it, help, let it end soon, discomfort, or it can be also a happy feet, as you also remember from the movie. So the idea that the same movement may have different meanings according to the context and to the specific person. This is the main thing to remember when we talk about recognizing emotions from the nonverbal expression. Think about the context and the person who is expressing the emotion. Emotion management is the last of the four competencies. And this is the ability to manage other people's emotions in an effective way. As I said, this is nothing bad. This is something that we do all the time. Your child comes to you crying and you try to cope with his sadness or fear or anger, whatever is the reason why he or she is crying. That's what we do all the time. And to do this, I would like to use one of the items of the test that we created, we in Geneva and we in collaboration with Nantes, with Sebastian. Probably he's gonna talk about this a little bit later, which is the JECO. Some of you probably have done it already online before coming here. And that is one of the cases, one item. Actually, this was built, as all the items, on real world scenarios. So we interviewed people like you and asked them about emotional situations and what to do in the, in, about them. So the item would read like this. One of your employees made a severe mistake by accidentally sending confidential documents to the wrong person. You know that this happened because she was not paying attention, enough attention. Actually, it was he. While confronting him, he starts crying, cl crying and claims that your demands are too high. What do you tell him? First possibility. From now on, every time you have to send an important document, you should come to me and we will check it together. I know you can perform better. Such a mistake cannot happen again. Think about it. We will discuss it another time. I'm sorry, my mistake. Please calm down. I always appreciated your work. It can happen. So remember, this is an employee of yours. You are responsible of him. And he made a mistake. The mistake is made. There's nothing you can do about it. And he comes to you and he starts crying. And says that you really have too high demands. I have to say that in the actual test there is another option that is wrong, of course, so I didn't include it. But I also expect that we will have quite a consensus here because of I, the reason I, that's why I chose this item, and also because of the audience, so a professional audience. So who among you would choose Option number one. Okay. Who among you would choose option number two? Okay. Who would say number three? Think about it. We will discuss it another time. Who would choose number four? I'm sorry, my mistake. Calm down. Okay. Actually, each of these options is based on a different way to handling the conflict that is behind this situation. Each of these subtends one of those. In the first case, you try to collaborate with the person. In the second case, you try to compete with the mistakes. So you clearly say the point that this is a mistake. So you go against the person somehow. Avoidance. You say, we talk about, we'll talk about it another time. You avoid the issue. Accommodation, you just take the blame in this case and say, well, it's not very important, I just take it down. In this case, the correct answer is number two, to compete. Because it's really a severe mistake. You don't want it to happen again. And you need to be sure that this person has understood that his mistake was extremely severe. On the same time, the mistake has been made and this person is not going to be fired because of this, cannot. So you need to somehow motivate him, manage his emotion. So the first thing you do is say, I know you can perform better. You try to put it in a more positive, immediately. You give him something. But then, you state immediately that the mistake is severe and it cannot happen again, otherwise it will have consequences, of course. That's implicit in the thing. And the thing, the main point is that we all should be able 
to choose which we do this all the time, just we don't know exactly what they are, but that's what we do all the time. We need to know which one to use in which situation. And that's part of the ability to manage other people's emotion, to know when to use a specific strategy in response to other people's emotion. This I will briefly go through. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can actually uh, get to a better understanding of the other person or you can relate better with the other person if you verbal mirror the other person or non-verbal mirroring. These are very simple strategies and you see very important people do this all the time to get aligned so then it's easier to deal with each other. <coughs> but let me conclude basically my talk just by trying to give you an idea of what this all means for you. We spoke about the relevance of emotion, we spoke about why emotional intelligence matters, why science tells us that emotional intelligence can actually have a big impact on your personal and professional life. The first thing that I would like you to take home with you is the idea that whenever you are ab about to experience an emotion, you're about to act about it. Think, get control before. You must know your emotion before you can manage or regulate it. This works both ways. So other people's emotion as yours. You need to understand and then you act. You may act without having understood correctly the situation, especially about yourself. Try to label your state. Try to understand why you're angry or sad or upset. But and then, what does it all mean for your work? I try to highlight four elements that I think, four keywords that I think are most relevant for you, I hope at least. So I put the word client, but that's basically um, a proxy for many other things. It can be your colleagues, it can be your supervisor, it can be your spouse, it can be your friends. The idea is that if you really want to have better relationships with others, personally and professionally, first thing you need to do is develop your empathy. Try to put yourself in your client's shoes. And to do this, it's very important to do the second part, which is focus on what he finds important. Understand what are the needs. I mean, if this person is going to get angry, probably because there is something that is very important for him in what you're going to tell about. So try to focus on this point. Third, positive mood. That's an element. We saw it before. I mean, I gave you scientific examples, scientific evidence that tells you the behavior of people changes, that even their answers change when it's in the, when the persons are in different moods, so more positive or more negative. And if you can put your partner, interaction partners, in a more positive mood, you're probably going to have better interaction. Most of us know this intuitively, or we studied about it, but it's really important. It changes a lot. Finally, last but extremely important, language. If you really want to be successful in, uh, in the relationship, Try to understand, try to imagine how he interprets what you tell him. I mean, we are not, I mean, I'm not a fin financial expert. If I go to look for financial advisor, advice, I meet some, somebody at the bank when I have my money, and say, okay, yeah, I would like to put some placement, some funds, what can we do? I, of course, have a lot at stake. I mean, I'm still sort of young. I have not so much money, so I have a life in front of me, my, uh, my daughter is going to grow at some point, so there's a lot at stake for me, and this is kind of an investment, so for me it's important, it's something I really want to do right, and I'm afraid of losing my money, or losing the possibility to take care of my family. So, if you start, if, if the advisor starts talking to me in a way that I don't understand the thing, my fear, my anxiety will just grow up and will grow up and I will not know exactly how to behave and this will impede my judgment because it will make a decision 
even more difficult to be made than it was at the beginning because I will feel like I'm not really in control of the situation. Whatever I will choose, I won't have chosen the thing just because I thought it was better, but just because maybe I understood it better. And I'll finish with this. Um, if you have to take the responsibility of others, these are just three little things that you can always keep in mind. If you are in a leadership position, be assertive. So you should give clear tasks to people. Because this avoids the misunderstandings that can lead to anger, frustration, fear. If the people don't understand what you ask them to do, they may get anxious because say, okay, maybe I do this, or maybe it wasn't this case, I have to do this. But, so be clear, be assertive, and understand what your colleagues think. So ask them if you're not sure. And I'd like to conclude by saying that emotional intelligence is something that we all have. And we all have since we are kids, children. I see my daughter, she's my daughter, Matilde. She's two years and a half. When she sees um, a friend at the kindergarten, at the crash, crying, she goes and looks for the pet, the, the, the teddy bear, the doudou, as we say in French, to give to him or to her in order to make her feel better. She already knows that she can help other people to feel better. And at the same time, she knows exactly how to manage the emotions of her parents, because when she comes and cries, she always gets what she wants. Thank you.